A lot of people have said that the Horizon IT scandal is one of the worst miscarriages of justice in British history. And remember, the British did colonization, slavery, and the fucking crusades. If you'd like to earn CPE credit for listening to this episode, visit earmarkcpe.com. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Continuing education has never been so easy. And now, on to the episode. Hello, and welcome to Oh My Fraud, a true crime podcast where our victims aren't killed, but sometimes they literally die waiting for the legal system to mete out justice. I'm Greg Kite. And I'm Postmaster Caleb Newquist. So, Postmaster, uh, before we get into it, uh, you cool if I read a, a listener review real quick? Please. Awesome. This one comes from Samantha B. CPA. Samantha says, Oh My Fraud is one of my top go-to podcasts, and I've been raving about it to all my colleagues at my firm. Greg and Caleb often have me chuckling to myself as I listen to their entertaining stories on the biggest scandals and fraud cases I never knew existed. Ah, that's an amazing review. Why am I talking in an Australian I accent? Oh, I, I don't know. What an amazing Oi. review. Amazing <laughs> review. Um, we need to hire her in, uh, to write ad copy for us, I think. I think so, too. Think? That was Yeah, why not? Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. If you like Oh My Fraud, please take a minute to write us a review. Even if you're not great at writing ad copy, uh, who knows? Uh, we still may read it on the show. Also, uh, if your firm's looking for in-house ethics or fraud training that does not suck, we do that. We also do keynote addresses at events and conferences. And don't worry, we can work clean, uh, but we can also work extra filthy too. It's kind of, if you hire us, it's up to you. Yeah, there's a spectrum. Yeah. So if you want more info on pricing and availability, send us an email at ohmyfraud at earmarkcpe.com. Perfect. So Caleb, let's change subjects. Okay. I want to know, have you personally ever been falsely accused of something? Could be falsely accused by the authorities, could be falsely accused by your sister or anywhere in between. Uh, has that ever happened to you? Yeah. I'll, I don't know if this really counts or not, but I have a, I have a, I have a story. Okay. Uh, one, one summer I was in college I, and I went to this small house party and some guy was like going around and asking people what year they graduated high school and he okay. was so wait whooping. so is this is this from a 1980s uh, teen movie i mean it kind of feels like yeah. it except it's it's a it, it's not that old okay not quite that old okay i mean if it if it had been you if you'd been telling this story it would it would have it would have been a 1980s yeah, teen movie likely right yeah yeah no but this one was it was '90s, and it was me, and so it was it was more, you know, ironic and and <laughs> lots more flannel. <laughs> okay, good, right, good, yeah, appropriate. Anyway, yeah, totally. Anyway, so this guy's going around and he's asking people what year they graduated high school, and he was whooping and high fiving people who were uh, class of '98 because he was class of '98. Hell yeah, yeah. And so he gets to me and asks, "Hey man, you class of '98?" And I said. Yeah, I'm class of 98, and he whoops and high-fives me so hard that I thought he dislocated my shoulder. <laughs> Wait, for for real or hyperbole? I mean hyperbole. Okay, <laughs> okay. But he did high-five me pretty hard. Anyway, so I go outside with a couple of friends, and, you know, class pride isn't exactly my forte, so what? I'm- What? I, yeah, I know, I know. Anyway, so I'm talking a little shit about this class of 98 zealot that we had just encountered because it was weird, right? <laughs> yeah, that I'm sounds like, kind of weird. It was kind of weird. And so, you know, a few minutes after that, the class of 98 fanatic is like coming straight at me with a head full of steam and he just shoves me right in the chest <laughs> as hard as I've ever been shoved uh -huh. in the chest up into that point and maybe ever since. And... <laughs> He goes, and he like this is a tall guy, like taller than me. I'm six two, and this guy was taller than me, uh, and had yeah. like you know a fucking goatee and a brush cut, and like you know Wrangler jeans on. Like he was, you know, 
he wrestles live animals for fun. Gotcha. You know, like that, yeah. Yeah. Intimidating. Not, not a good situation for In, me. Intimi- intimidating. As a, and as a as a bookish as a bookish, right? Like nonviolent type. Right. And here comes this this Cobra Kai member straight at you. <laughs> Cobra Kai with you know, like I said, you know, with a very large belt buckle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> still, it still plays. Right. Different kind of belt. Anyway. <laughs> He's uh, he, he he shows me straight in the chest. He says, you talk good shit about the class of 98. And he's just shouting that at me. And I'm like, what? Because it's the strangest question I've ever heard in my life. Shit about an entire uh, group of people that spans the entire world. Are you? Right. Yeah. Huh. And he repeats himself. You talk shit about the class of 98. And I'm like, why are you accusing me of talking shit about the class of 98? I just high fived you in that fucking kitchen <laughs> about being in the class of ninety eight. Why would I be talking shit about class of ninety eight? I'm class of ninety eight. And if you haven't picked up on it, this guy wasn't exactly a scholar, so he was a- apparently satisfied by this explanation, and he he stormed off to crush more beer cans on his head or something. I don't know. <laughs> but- that was the end of it. Nice. And so, so, uh, so, I, I, I got out virtually, uh, mo- you know, unscathed. Yeah. So, so, so really, you were accused of talking shit about the, you were falsely accused of talking yes. shit about the class of 98 when what you yes. really had done was you had really just talked shit about a guy who was excited about the class of 98. So you were yeah. technically falsely accused. Yeah. Technically, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll back you up in a court of law. Okay. All right. Cool. I mean, that's that's what I got. That's what I got for the show, Greg. Okay, it's great. I love it. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, cool. That is super relevant because today's episode is all about hundreds of people who were falsely accused of stealing thousands of pounds from the British post office. Fun fact. The United States post office actually predates the United States. In 1775, the Second Continental Congress officially created the Post Office of the United States. And Article 1, Section 8, Clause 7 of the Constitution of the United States of America gives Congress the power to establish a post office and post roads. Our system is a federal system. It is not, nor has it ever been privatized. It's been attempted. They've tried. They've tried. They've talked about it. And I always feel like that's a very strange the idea to privatize the post office is very strange to me. That just doesn't seem right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And just cause we're, but I, but I think it's just cause we're not used to that. that yes. Yeah. And that's what I was about to say. It's cause like, it, it's obvious. We're, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. Feels like, very foreign. Is that a good way to say it? Yeah. Foreign literally for literally feels especially. foreign. Right. Foreign. Right. The post office is in the United Kingdom, however, has a very different origin story. And so, Here it is. The roots of the current postal system go back to 1516 when Henry VIII established the master of posts because how else was he going to get his dick pics to Anne Bolin? There's no other way. No other way. You got to have a master of the posts. Right. He can't text him. It's 1516 for Christ's sake. Right. At that point, mail services were only for rich people. But that all changed in 1635 when, according to many sources, King Charles I made it available to all. There's only been three Charleses in 400 years. That's <laughs> the, not enough Charleses, really, when you think seems, about it. Seems like a small number. Anyway, it didn't say how he made it available to all, but I assume that means he just made it cheaper. But also, back then, postage was paid by the recipient, so maybe... 17th century Brits were cool playing, you know, exorbitant postage. If not paying meant they wouldn't get that love letter from Mr. Darcy. Uh, re- wait, re- so recipients, the recipients were paying for postage. They drive on the left side of the roads. Those limey bastards, they got, they're just doing everything wrong is what it feels like to me. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, limey bastards is going to age real well. I'm, yeah, it is. Anyway, the modern postal service in the UK was established in 1660 by King Charles II. 
Wow. So two Charleses in quick succession and then no Charles for 400 years, almost for 350 years, basically. Interesting. Yeah. A lot Interesting. of, yeah. Because mm. wait, because right now we're, he's Charles the third? Charles the third. Oh, yeah. I don't know about this monarchy business. Anyway, originally the Postal Service served only England and Wales, but eventually it grew to cover all of Great Britain. The postage stamp wasn't invented until 1837, and in 1840, the General Post Office issued the Penny Black, which was the first postage stamp used anywhere in the world. Why was there three years between when the postage stamp was invented and when it was first used? I don't know. Let's say COVID. COVID that's, that's, yeah, <laughs> probably COVID. COVID-19. Pro- yeah, co- well, COVID-1840. Uh, 1830, 1837 yeah. through 1840. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. The introduction of the postage stamp did three things. First, it established a flat rate for mail that weighed up to half an ounce. Before the stamp, postage was charged based on distance. Weird. No, no, makes perfect sense to me. (laughs) Does it? You want to mail this around the corner? You want to mail it uh, uh, 2,000 miles away? That's what I think Mm. our current, I think the flat rate is crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah. Okay. Second, stamps created a prepay mail system. Instead of a postage being paid by the recipient, that seems like a smart thing. Yeah. Yeah? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems like a convenience thing to me. Sure. So, but at the same yeah, time. What if the what if the letter shows up and, you know, the, the recipient is broke? Right. But also, think about this. If you, if the postman came and said, hey, hey, Mr. Newquist, you got some mail today. Do you got enough money to pay for it or do you just want to not know what came? And that would be hard to not go, let me go search in my couch to find some coins to give because i right. would, i'd be so curious i wouldn't want to you know fomo would make yeah. me pay that charge even if like it I was said, I'm, not, I'm not getting text messages in 1660 right right the only way you, you're too you're just not going to care you i'd be so curious i'd pay I'd, I'd pay quite a bit for that mail right so right. third the advent of the postage stamp was the birth of the strange and nerdy hobby of stamp collecting Correct. And fun fact that the Penny Black, the very first stamp, uh-huh. uh, if like a mint condition, actually, what's your guess? Did, or did you see my note? What's your I guess as to what a mint I... condition Penny Black would, co- would, 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 what you'd be able to get if you had one? So a stamp, uh, you know, 180 years old, 180, 190 year old stamp. Yeah. Mint condition. Yeah. Mint condition. Top of the line. Uh, Top shelf. 2.3 million pounds. No, only $3,000. Doesn't that seem ridiculously low? The most valuable stamp is, is called the British, uh, uh, Guana, the British Guiana. That's it. The British Guiana one cent magenta, which is valued at uh, $9.4 million dollars so if My you got that God. first stamp you're a sucker and a loser but if you got that british guiana one cent magenta you uh you got a winner you nerd you why damn is that one so bad did you figure out why that one was so valuable uh yeah because i mean look at the name it's a oh it's magenta it's got guiana in it's very exotic yeah magenta i understand yeah okay cool a bunch of weird rebranding, restructuring, and reorganization happened between 1969 and 2011. The details are complex and boring, and we lost interest and decided to skip over all that. You're, but, wel- you're welcome. Yeah. But then huge changes came with the Postal Services Act of 2011. The act allowed up to 90% of royal mail, because that is the, that is, that's what the, the, what was that? The, kind of the branding of the yeah, the like service? the like right. the official trade name of the yeah. British postal post office, right? So, the Postal Services Act of 2011 allowed 90 percent of Royal Mail to be privatized, and it became a publicly traded company in 2013. So weird, yeah, very weird. And the British government sold the last of its shares in 2015. Mm-hmm. 
one very significant way that the UK Postal Service is different from the US Postal Service has to do with sub postmasters. Uh, sub postmasters have been around in the United Kingdom since the 1800s. An article we found in Computer Weekly does a good job summing up what sub postmastering is all about. It says uh, sub postmasters have a contract with the post office to run branches, but they are not employees of the post office. They usually have a retail business that is connected to the post office. The idea being that the retail operation will gain more customers through the post office drawing people in. For instance, let's say you had a drugstore in uh, in Sussex. Uh, you could also become a sub postmaster and open an official branch of the UK post office right inside your pharmacy so that then when people come inside to send letters or to buy postage, since they're already in your pharmacy, they'll also refill their Lipitor and grab a cheap last minute Valentine's gift to help their failing marriage limp along for a few more months, just the way CVS does in the United States. Just without the without the post office stuff, but still with the cheap Valentine's. You know what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. You can send it straight from the CVS. Uh, th th if you had a post office, you could send it straight from the CVS to your estranged spouse. Yes. With whom you're trying to help a, a failing marriage limp along for a few months. Brilliant. Right. You're, see, you're always one step ahead. As of 2023, about 99% of all UK post offices are franchises that are run by sub postmasters who are, as we said, independent business people. The other 1% are called crown post offices, which I assume by the name means they're all run by King Charles III. So mm. the answer to what does the British monarchy even do is they sell stamps. I, I'm assuming, I don't really, I haven't looked into it super closely, but I believe that that's accurate. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, running a post office franchise as a sub postmaster is a very unique situation. As a franchise operator, you're not charged any fees or commissions by Post Office Limited, which is basically the name for Post Office Corporate, or as John Oliver would say, Post Office Limited is the franchisee's business daddy. Once you obtain a post office franchise, you do need to buy and install equipment for the franchise. However, under certain circumstances, uh, the corporate post office might make a financial contribution towards the equipment. Then you make money primarily by getting a cut of all postage sold at your franchise anywhere between 9% to 18%. In 1999, the post office introduced the Horizon Accounting and Inventory Software Program. The Horizon system was intended to transform the existing paper-based branch accounting into an electronic system covering the full range of post office services. But almost immediately, sub-postmasters started complaining that the Horizon system was shit. Specifically, it was falsely reporting accounting shortfalls, sometimes to the tune of thousands of pounds. Not y good. Yikes. Yeah. So the sub postmasters brought it up with the post office and the post office told them to shut up because the system was right. But it wasn't. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the problem wasn't just that the Horizon system glitches were showing cash and inventory shortfalls for many of its sub postmasters. The other problem was the contract between the post office and the sub postmasters. It reads... The operator shall be fully liable for any loss of or damage to any post office cash and stock, any deficiencies in stocks of products, and or any resulting shortfall in the money payable to the post office limited must be made good by the operator without delay, so that in the case of any shortfall, post office limited is paid the full amount." So, the accounting system imposed by the post office was showing false deficiencies and shortfalls, and the sub-postmaster contract required them to pay for any deficiencies and shortfalls out of their own pocket. That seems bad. Yeah. It, and, well, it seems rough, but also, I kind of get it, because if they're going, hey, the money that you deposited with us doesn't match what you were supposed to sell, right. then it's like, so you fucked up, so send us the money. 
I, yeah. I, and, and again, so all these, I, I, I've been, I, I've been part of writing enough contracts that I know that the person in power writes the contract to favor them v- very strongly. And yeah. And, and, and a lot of, and these postmasters are probably like, yeah, yeah, cool. If that ever, it's not going to happen. I'm a good business person. So, so whatever. Yeah. If it, if there's a discrepancy, sure. I got gotcha. you. Yep. And the post office refused to entertain any suggestions that the problem was with the software. There were some 11,000 sub postmasters in the UK. Approximately 3,500 of them were affected by the problems in the Horizon accounting system, and 900 of them were criminally prosecuted for theft and fraud. Here are a handful of the stories of those affected. In 2002, Seema Misra and her husband Devinder decided they wanted a second child, but it wasn't until 2010 that they were able to conceive and Seema became pregnant. In the meantime, specifically in 2005, uh, Seema acquired a post office and became a sub post mistress. But from day one, she was aware that something was wrong with the accounting system. The person who trained her on the Horizon system told her that the accounts were always off and that she should just make up for any shortfalls with money from the non-post office part of the business. Uh, That ended up not being as easy as her trainer made it sound. And at one point, Seema even had to sell some of her jewelry to make up for Horizon's discrepancies. Eventually... Seema was accused of stealing 74,000 pounds. Her court date was set in 2010. She was pregnant with her second child, and coincidentally, she was ordered to appear in court on her first child's 10th birthday. She knew that jail time was a possibility, but she was confident it wouldn't come to that because she knew that she hadn't done anything wrong. That's why she literally fainted when the judge handed down a 15-month jail sentence. She was imprisoned in the largest female prison in the UK. Actually, it's the largest female prison in all of Europe, where she was convinced her life was in danger, as was the life of her unborn baby. She was at rock bottom and says that the only thing keeping her from committing suicide was the fact that she was pregnant with her second child. She ended up being released after serving four months, and in 2011, she gave birth to her second child while she was still wearing her electronic probation tag. She had been a pillar of the community, but had been disgraced. People in her community labeled her as a thief who stole money from old people, and after her picture appeared on the front page of their local newspaper, her husband got beaten up by a bunch of strangers. Martin and Gina Griffiths became sub postmaster and sub postmistress of the Farm Road Post Office in Great Sutton in 1995. 14 years later, in 2009, they started seeing unexplained shortfalls. By 2013, the shortfalls had accumulated to 57,000 pounds. That same year, armed robbers busted into their store, smashed Martin's hat with a crowbar, and stole 54,000 pounds out of their safe. Martin and Gina paid more than 100,000 pounds total to the post office in an effort to balance the books, wiping out their life savings. Regardless, the post office revoked their status as a sub-postmaster and postmistress, citing their failure to manage their accounts and the branch's security properly. And so Martin Griffiths, at age 58, threw himself in front of a bus. Uh, He left a note for his family apologizing and telling them that he loved them. Peter Huxham was a popular sub-postmaster from Starcross, a village on the banks of the River X. He was charged and convicted of stealing 16,000 pounds based on data from the Horizon IT system and was sentenced to eight months in jail. But Peter's story is a little different in that he didn't question the veracity of the Horizon IT system. He assumed that it was correct and that the 16,000 pounds was in fact missing. And since only Peter and his wife Jackie had access to the cash at their branch, Peter, using his powers of deductive reasoning, accused his wife of stealing all that money. His accusations eventually led to the collapse of their 22-year marriage. 
As a result of his incarceration and the loss of his marriage, Peter developed an alcohol problem and mental health issues, and he isolated himself from the friends and family uh, that, you know, he wasn't already estranged from. That's why his body wasn't found until weeks after his death, weeks after his death. By that time, his corpse was so decomposed that his cause of death was impossible to accurately identify but regardless, his death has been treated as a suspected suicide. But then there was Alan Bates. In 1998, he bought a post office in North Wales, but his contract with the post office was terminated in 2003 because of a 1,000 pound shortfall. As a result, he lost his job, his life savings, and his retirement plan. But Bates refused to accept that the accounting errors were his fault, so he set up a website to find other sub postmasters who were getting screwed and his story was picked up by computer weekly Bates and his fellow fucked over sub postmasters formed an organization called the justice for sub postmasters Alliance. It was supposed to be called justice for fucked over postmasters, but they even in Britain, that was too far. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't do it. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Anyway, Eventually, Bates initiated a civil group litigation against the post office. The litigation represented 555 sub postmasters and was settled in 2019 for 58 million pounds total. I so wish it was 666 postmasters, but that it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the litigants owed 47 million pounds in legal fees, <laughs> so the difference of 11 million split 555 ways was just about 20,000 pounds per person. Not nothing, but clearly not enough to adequately compensate for years of lost wages, lost life savings, and lost retirement plans, not to mention jail time, lost reputations, like the, the uh, yeah, that 20,000 pounds is not going to make up for all that. No, not for, not by a damn sight. A hundred, uh, for hundreds of sub postmasters. Yeah. Arguably the biggest win was that Alan Bates and his cohort brought this entire problem to light. Politicians started getting involved and more sub-postmasters gained the courage to talk about their stories. It eventually came out that although the post office received thousands of complaints about the Horizon system, their staff was instructed to tell everyone who contacted them that they were the only ones experiencing any problems. So, so it was like, hey, come on. Hey, my system is telling me that I owe 57,000 pounds. I go, what the fuck are you talking about? And it's like, yeah, the, the system's crappy. First we've crappy. heard of it. It's like, it if 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 the system was broken, don't you think we would have heard from other sub postmasters? This is your problem. Shut up and pay us our money. Wanker. It was also revealed that by 2017, the post office knew that the losses it was charging sub postmasters with could be explained by errors in the Horizon IT system or alternately by remote tampering. But the post office continued to doggedly pursue sub postmasters, insisting that there's no other explanation for the shortfalls besides theft and fraud. A public inquiry was launched in 2021 where evidence was heard from the post office and from Fujitsu, the company that engineered the Horizon system. Since then, overwhelming evidence has been produced showing the fault was with the Horizon system and not with the sub-postmasters. Starting from the first prosecution until now, over 60 affected sub-postmasters have died waiting for justice, including four suicides. Hey. As of this recording, only 95% of criminal convictions related to the Horizon IT scandal have been overturned. That means that there's about 45 people still in jail because of glitches in the accounting system implemented by the post office. The British government has set up three different compensation tracks for those who have been affected by the Horizon IT scandal. They don't call them tracks. They call them schemes because they're British, and in Britain, words don't mean what words are supposed to mean, so they call them <laughs> schemes. It's a scheme. uh, the first scheme was for those 555 sub-postmasters that we spoke about earlier, uh, they're being offered settlements of 75,000 pounds, but many are expected to push for uh, more. 
Uh, the second scheme is that any sub postmaster whose conviction has been overturned is being offered a 600,000 pound settlement. And the third scheme is any sub postmasters who were not convicted or part of the 555 Bates group can receive a fixed payment of 75,000 pounds. Just this year, in 2024, a TV miniseries called Mr. Bates vs. the Post Office was released where actor Toby Jones plays Alan Bates. In real life, the 69-year-old Alan Bates is reasonably handsome. Unfortunately, Toby Jones is not. Have you seen the first Captain America movie? In that, the bad guy, Red Skull, was played by Hugo Weaving. Uh, he also, uh, Hugo Weaving also played Agent Smith in the Matrix movies. Uh, Toby Jones, however, played Red Skull's weird looking little sidekick. That's who they cast to play the hero of this story. In episode 49 of this podcast, we talked about Frank Tassone, who stole millions of dollars from the Roslyn School District in New York. They made a movie about that and cast Hugh Jackman as Frank Tassone. In this one, they cast Toby Jones as Alan Bates. Oof, that's like casting David Cross as me. I mean, I'd still love that. Uh, he's bald with a beard and glasses, so it makes sense. But overall, he's not an attractive gentleman, and that would hurt my feelings. So cast him as me in a movie where I'm the bad guy, like where I defraud Caleb Newquist and Oh My Fraud, the podcast out of millions of dollars. And also, you got to cast Alexander Gudinov as Caleb Newquist. You got to because he's a dead ringer for you. Okay, Greg. Uh, did we learn anything? Uh, I I did learn. Oh. I learned it. I learned at least a couple of things. Okay. Um, so uh, so when we were going through the different uh, anecdotal stories of the different uh, sub postmasters and sub postmistresses who were affected by this, one of them, uh, pr possibly the most heartbreaking of them, uh, was Peter Huxman from Starcross. Um, he and one of the things he was the one who accused his wife of stealing the sixteen thousand yep. pounds. Um, but uh, in our research, uh, he he wasn't alone. He wasn't the only one who believed that the Horizon system was right and that the money was actually missing. Uh, I found another story about a sub post mistress named Joe Hamilton who also genuinely believed the discrepancies that she was accused of had been caused by her own her own mistakes. So mm. she she on her own volition pleaded guilty to the charges that were brought against her um to, because she was she was offered if she had if she if she pleaded guilty she would just be on probation and wouldn't have to actually serve the jail time um but she legit believed that yeah she must have made some some big error and owed and that she legit owed all that money so the thing the thing that I guess was reinforced by that for me, Caleb, was that numbers plus confidence is extremely convincing. So with yes. the post office, they were like, no, the system is there. The system shows these hard numbers that were shortfalls. You have to pay it to us because the system is right. Don't fuck with our system. You're a bad person. Pay us the fucking money. It's extremely convincing. And, and we usually see that in the other way where people where, where it's the con man because again con man stands for confidence man yep. so so you you're saying hey here's these are the right numbers believe me and don't be a dumb shit and do what i'm saying or you know act accordingly but but like i said whether you're committing the fraud or being accused of fraud uh numbers plus confidence uh can be very manipulative yeah so and there was another yes. thing Oh, the, okay. There was a, yeah. There's another thing uh, that came to mind with this story. Like we said earlier, uh, there were about eleven thousand sub postmasters. Uh, Nine hundred of them were prosecuted as part of the scandal, uh, which is about eight percent of the sub postmasters who yep. were who were prosecuted uh, for crimes. But uh, but also in, in another account that I that I read, thirty five hundred people were affected by the scandal. That's about thirty percent of the sub postmasters, and and really that's one of the things. And, and Alan Bates pointed this out. That's one of the main things that made it obvious 
to anyone like Alan Bates who was paying attention that the problem was with the accounting system and be, because how how does overnight anywhere somewhere between eight percent and thirty percent of all sub postmasters it, right. it turn evil and start stealing money from the post office those those numbers don't make sense doesn't make any sense yeah. at right. all so right. so that that was kind of an indicator that. Like I said, that the people were innocent and that there was a problem with the system. But, and this might be horrible to say out loud, okay. uh, but think about it. Likely, there were some sub-postmasters, at least a few, who were actually crooked and were actually stealing money from the post office while this whole scandal was going down. So, so if that was the case, they they likely got fined and sentenced and sent to jail, which is great because for those people, that was justice. But now those same people who were actually stealing money from the post office and did actually receive justice for crimes they actually committed are now receiving 600,000 pounds settlements just because they happened to steal at the exact time that a massive IT problem was also happening. That's like that's like it, it getting pulled over. This has happened to me a number of times where I've gotten pulled over for speeding. I knew 100% that I was speeding, but then the police officer comes back and like throws my license at me and 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 is like, "Hey, you got lucky because I'm getting pulled away on another call." But in this case, he would throw my license at me and also hand me a check for six hundred thousand dollars as he went off to his other his other call. Right. So, uh, so basically, the other thing I learned is bad guys, uh, theoretically, bad guys could get very lucky uh, when the circumstances are in their favor. When karma is asleep. Bad guys could get very, very lucky. Yeah, yeah. You have to, yeah. Sometimes you know the 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 glitches in the glitches. There's a glitch and a glitch. Yeah, but then, and then yeah, the bad guys win. Yeah. Yep. Horrible. Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Um. Anyway, well, any British any other yeah. any other thoughts you have about? What have I been thinking about? This this case is weird for our podcast. It is weird for our podcast because it, it's about fraud, but it's about fraud. It kind of turns it on its head. Yeah, this is a bunch of people that got convicted falsely of fraud. Right. It's about a fraud that wasn't there. Right. Yeah. The fraud that wasn't there mm -hmm. might be a title. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I think. Oh, here's something I was thinking about. Let me ask you this. In the research, did you ever get the feeling? that these postmasters, the sub postmasters were kind of deferential with the, with the exception of clearly Mr. Bates and some others, but like, did you get the sense they were deferential to the post office? And so like, you know, you had the examples of the people who were like, yeah, I must've gosh, if they say I screwed it up, I must've screwed it up. That to me is there's a, there's a certain, I think in like maybe British culture, like there's certain deference for, authority okay. and like you know kind of like the bureaucracy and like civil mm. servant civil service or you know yeah yeah public service those kinds of things the the vibe of that whole thing in the culture of great britain is very different than it is in america whereas in america like the trust in like institutions is like and maybe it's just more current but it's just like it feels like trust in institutions like there's more skepticism i think yeah, yeah you yeah. know and so, like, if it was a similar thing, I don't know. You could probably find a similar American scandal to this, but I, I don't know. Mm. Like, I, I guess the deference given to the post office in this case is something that kind of surprised. Well, not yeah. surprised me, but I think it, it, in in some way, it um, kind of rang true that in in British culture they'd be like, oh, well, you know, they they're smart people running you know, these, these, these right. things. And so right. they're probably well, right. And I wonder, maybe that's echoes of like the, you know, f my, my very, uh, incomplete understanding of British history. Uh, you know, that they, it, government was a iron fisted monarchy at times Yeah, sure. where it's like, if the government says it's this way, then you need to shut up and, 
agree with that or else things are going to go poorly for you. So I kind of, which, which it, that's, that's more, I mean, cause I, 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 I see what you're talking about, about the deference that, that the sub postmasters showed to the post office, but it wasn't that they didn't because so many of them, like I said, there, there was, there was literally thousands of sub postmasters who called the post office and was like, there's problems with the system. Oh, okay. And they, yep, and true. they shed, they, but, but that's the thing. So, so there was an initial questioning going, Hey, this is showing shortfalls. I'm not mishandling my money like this. Something's wrong. And this, and the post office was like, shut up. The system's good. You're wrong. Pay us the money. Here's what the contract says. Do it. Mm, and so, yeah. and then that's when they were like, mm, okay, I guess I got to do that. So, like I said, that, that that's more you know we were the ones who were like you know throwing tea into the boston harbor uh to to stick it to to uh which 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 king was that that was king george the third that's king george the third is who that was uh so we were sticking it to we were sticking it to the king whereas in a lot of british history it seems like the king was sticking it to the people and that like i said maybe that explains part of the cultural differences between that you're talking about between the u.s and brits yeah maybe could be maybe exciting i mean it's i mean it's it's obviously tragic when like people are falsely accused and it it ruins people's lives yeah it's just like it's fucking it's just gut-wrenching you know yeah about that stuff yeah well and um and as an epilogue i mean they're now that and and it's so funny how this uh this but there's mi- cases still unresolved right there's cases still unresolved but this mini series this this pop culture event is yeah. the thing that's bringing this to everyone's attention and there is outrage uh in the united kingdom against the government that right. they have not that that it happened that it happened for so long that the that the post office was so entrenched in its stance that they were you know above reproach with their system um and now that it now that it's clear that it's that things are messed up why 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 doesn't everybody have all the compensation yesterday for the tragedies that have happened made whole and then some because you can't talk about i mean it, it doesn't take long about talking about people stepping in front of buses and and uh getting their marriages their 22 year marriages ruined by right. this before you just go yeah this is in this this is a this is a tragic miscarriage of justice or or pregnant women in prison like uh, this is, yeah all of yeah. it yeah hard uh. all right that's it for this episode remember if you're into bdsm and you were having an affair with a woman who was a sub but you're not having that affair anymore the person you were having the affair with is technically a sub post mistress very nice. Very nice. And also remember, if you ever make a movie based on a real life fraud, justice has been perverted if the bad guy is played by Hugh Jackman or if the good guy is played by Toby Jones. If you want to drop us a line, send us an email at ohmyfraud at earmarkcpe.com. Caleb, if people just want to get a hold of you and cut me out, how can they do that? Uh, LinkedIn forward slash Caleb Newquist. If people want to cut me out, which they often do, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, same thing. Go to LinkedIn. Uh, I'm Greg Kite CPE on LinkedIn. Look for look for a uh, CPE CPE CPE. Well, no CPA. <laughs> I do a lot of CPE, but I'm CPA. Look for the guy who's vaguely similar to David Cross. David and Cross. That, that'd be me. Right. Okay. Oh, my fraud is written by Greg Kite and myself. Our producer is Zach Frank. If you like watching these podcasts, you can watch them on YouTube or listen to them on YouTube, whatever you want to do. But just know if that's how you like to consume podcasts, go to YouTube, find Oh My Fraud, listen there. Some people like it though. If you like listening to this podcast, who knows, you might also like watching this podcast and you're in luck because this podcast is on YouTube. Go on there. Search Oh My Fraud. You'll find it. You'll like it. You'll be hooked. It's like the Joe Rogan experience, just not dumb. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, including on YouTube. If you listen on Earmark, though, you can get CPE. You can't get CPE on YouTube. So 
Well, you could, a, you could, well, you could watch a, it on YouTube and then take the quiz on the Earmark app, and you nailed it. Oh, see, look at Easy. that, Greg Kite. So, Greg Kite. I'm, everybody. I'm a power user of the Earmark CPE app. I've got, I, it's, I'm, I'm six months early, and I've already got all my CPE done for my two year uh, reporting period. Wow. Thank, like, thanks, Earmark CPE. Be like, be like Greg Kite, CPA, CPAs. CPAs? CP, Greg Kite CPE. CPEs. <laughs> Join us next time for more avarice swindlers and scams from stories that will make you say, oh my oh fraud. Oh my fraud. Oh my fraud. Oh my fraud.